Welcome to the Healthy Perspective Podcast with your host, chiropractor, entrepreneur, mentor, and author, Dr. Chris Bowman. He'll break down and extract the secret sauce behind his own success and the success of some of the top leaders in every category and from around the world. Get ready for your weekly mental adjustment because shift is going to happen. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Healthy Perspective Podcast. Today, we have Cedric Bertelli. He is the founder and director of the Emotional Health Institute, an organization that provides information and education about emotional resolution, or MRES. Cedric and the Emotional Health Institute give people struggling with stress, depression, anxiety, and many other negative emotions access to the best trained professionals who can guide them to resolve disruptive emotional patterns. In addition to training mental health professionals, coaches, and educators on emotional resolution, Cedric also works with clients individually and is passionate about helping people across the world resolve their emotional difficulties. And we were talking a little bit before air, um, uh, before we started recording and just the importance of this topic right now um, rolling from COVID, rolling out of COVID and the emotional stress and, and division and disruption um, that that caused on so many different levels. And I think there's more people struggling with anxiety and depression and anger and the whole spectrum of, of emotional challenges more than ever before. I know we've experienced it in our practice. Um, so Cedric, I'm super thankful and excited to have you on today. I'm very excited to be here as well. Thank you for having me on the show, Chris. Of course. So why don't you uh, start off with a little bit of like, is this something that you always wanted to do or or what was your kind of journey into what you're doing right now? I guess I always was uh, interested by emotions and how emotions are made and how we can resolve emotional difficulties without going through years of therapy. Um, this is a second career for me. The first career was working in hospitality business. I was working for the Ritz-Carlton first as a chef and then uh, I worked in restaurants and um, the banquet director. But what I noticed there too on the workplace is that you do not manage people when mm -hmm. you have employees. You manage them, you know, you you make sure that people are happy at work, that uh, they like the co-worker, that they feel um, excited about their mission, about what they do. Even if it's carrying plate, you need to, uh, you know, um, highlight a flame in in them so they, they're happy to, to come to work every day. And... Um, Myself, I always was dealing with low-grade depression, anxiety, a lot of uh, self-directed anger. No one could tell. You know, as a child, it was more difficult to hide. But later on, as you know, when we, we grew up as adults, no one can tell what we're going through. But anyway, in 2009, um, economy went down and a lot of things were changing in the company. And um, I decided to do something that really was uh, fueling my soul. And I decided to quit my job and to go back to France. I was in the States already and to learn uh, more about emotions and how emotions are made and and specifically how to work on emotions using the body. Mm. And not so much talk therapy, but more somatic, a somatic approach. And the rest is history, so to speak. I've been yeah. doing that since 2009, came back in the US in 2011, uh, kept on studying, doing a lot of sessions. And in 2019, uh, with my colleague Jacques Fumex in France, um, we uh, opened the Emotional Health Institute. And we're operating out of France, the USA, and Japan now uh, since the beginning of the year. Congratulations. And that's it. Thank that's you. amazing. So you obviously you can take emotion so many different ways. There, there's so many perspectives on on emotions and you know, and and that's why it's, I'm thankful for people like you where counseling might work for some, chiropractic or neurofeedback or or diet, or you know, like the, the, it all depends on where the root cause and and sure. really where the person is going to let you in. Um, what kind of led you down the path to, to um, developing MRES? I think what led me most to, uh, on this path is watching my grandfather. I, I often talk about him. He turned 100 years old last week. Wow. And Yeah. Uh, and he's, uh, he was a resistant in World War II. And um, I always was fascinated how people from this generation, not as a generality, of course, but how most people in the, in his generation who fought World War II, yeah. the way they handled trauma, how different it is from the way that we handle trauma, my generations, younger generations, how can they go through so much um, pain and suffering? And my grandfather was an immigrant, so he immigrated from Italy to France. He wasn't treated well at all. Yeah. But I was 
fascinated by these Brazilians. I mean, my, my grandfather in many ways is like a Buddhist monk, you know, so to speak. Wow. He's, he's wise, he's, he's just a simple guy. And anyway, so I, I was wondering what what leads somebody to handle trauma one way different to, to the other ones compared to others? And then I looked a little bit at what happened for him and people of his generation. After World War II, he moved to France and he started working in woods. He was a lumberjack. And he worked with all the men who shared a same history, a same experience. They never talked about it, you know. But I started thinking, okay, they, they are in nature, moving their body, hmm. uh, sharing a space among all the men who share a similar experience. And they never stopped working because they needed to provide. So they had the purpose. And all this, I mean, all this made that why well, they became resilient or well, they were resilient. They were able to tap into something that is natural, that is present in, now I can tell, in all mammals, hmm. which is a natural capacity for emotional resolution. Hmm. And looking at my grandpa, there was a beginning, but then studying the work of Lisa Thelman Barrett, Antonio Damasio, and other neuroscientists, I started to understand that disruptive emotional pattern, like recurrent uh, uh, I don't know, anxiety, anger, mm -hmm. all this stuff. All they are are literally dis um, uh, outdated predictions from the brain. Yeah. The prediction that we never have an opportunity to let um, update. And so MRS is all about that, is how can we allow the body the most simply and safely and fast way to update those obsolete predictions? That's so good. You know, there's a um, a workshop that I've been giving for a long time called the gut brain connection, you know, and we talk about obviously the microbiome and, and, you know, all of that stuff, but we, we tap into the vagus nerve and the parasympathetics and, and what, what emotions are is, is learned meaning to a chemical. Like, you know, like it, it's that, that's what makes us human is be able to take something inert. I mean, it's, it, there, there is no inherent anger in, this or stress in cortisol or you know what but our brain has learned to apply yes. when this is present this is how i'm supposed to respond yeah absolutely absolutely we we, we know exactly now how emotions are made i mean mm -hmm. at, at the origin of every disruptive emotional pattern anxiety all that mm -hmm. it's always the same time of type of, same type of event it's what we're going to call a trauma yeah now what is a trauma a trauma is an instant that holds too much stress physical or emotional for us to take on at the instant where we live it. Right. So if we are like uh, two days old or 42 years old, we, different things are going to impact us differently. Mm -hmm. But what we understand is that at the instant of trauma, if the prefrontal cortex is already operation, operational, so to speak, we're going to have, we're going to experience dissociation. Yeah. That means that uh, the prefrontal cortex context is going to be inhibited. So we don't suffer too much yeah. during this instant of trauma. Yeah. And when this is happening, the prefrontal cortex, one of the main roles is to funnel information. Mm -hmm. the, the cognitive brain gather about 2,000 bits of information per second. Mm -hmm. The subconscious has a potential to gather about 400 billion bits of information wow. per second. Wow. So that means that during dissociation, there's no more funnel and the subconscious is all open. It's like a vortex. Mm -hmm. And you gather all the information available during this instant of trauma. What you smell what uh, yeah. uh what you sense that everything everything available yeah. through the five senses everything but in a non-logical way right it's not it's not logical it's not linear it's just an humongous amount of information trapped boom, like this and the subconscious also record the physical sensation that you feel in your body during mm -hmm. this instant of trauma mm -hmm. and that's what's important and as you said earlier when the body recognizes later on one or several elements that were present during a past trauma, it is going to predict what physical sensations you're about to feel yeah. based on what was felt during this specific trauma. And it's going to generate this physical sensation that we call interoception. That's how we know that we feel an emotion. These physical sensations, it's only an outdated prediction. And our problem as human beings is that we learn to control these physical sensations very early on. Mm -hmm. We learn through our parents, through our education, Mm -hmm. We never let the prediction plays out until the end. And that's why the patterns keep on coming back. That's so good. You know, there's a, there's a story. Um, I used to live in Orange County when I was going to chiropractic school. And there is um, a trail that me and a buddy would always run. I don't remember the name, Carbon Canyon or, or something like that. And there was one time um, I was running and I came around a curve and there was a baby rattlesnake 
right there. And it, it, it freaked me out. I jumped over it. Luckily, you know, nothing ever happened. But there's another time that I was running a uh, very similar situation and a stick hit me. And I'm like, oh, I just got bit. Like, you know what I mean? I looked yeah. down and, and obviously a stick, it didn't feel like a, a snake bite. I didn't even, I don't even know what a snake bite would feel like, but the situation was so similar and the reaction was so massive when I saw that snake that it didn't, it didn't let me do anything else, you know? That's um, it. And I think that's what, what happens. And, and most of the time, and I think you'll agree most of the time, that's really helpful. You know, like I, I would rather jump over a stick and mistake it for a snake than just plow through it and not do anything. You know, I, I think that's one powerful thing. And I think maybe our, sometimes our sympathetic and, and these, these emotions and whatnot get blanket labeled as these are bad emotions. They are survival emotions. But if you're living in a chronic state of survival, that's when you're start going to start to have issues. A hundred percent. You know, uh, people, when they come to uh, see, uh, see us, they say, well, but we don't want to resolve our emotions. You're never going to resolve the emotions. It's not about that. It's about resolving the emotions that are not congruent with your current reality. Yeah. So, so you can experience the emotion that are congruent with what is actually happening now. Instead of reacting, no, it's, re it's, it's really a, a feeling what life is giving you now. If now there's a danger, you're going to feel, you're going to feel there's a danger. But you're not gonna feel in danger if right now everything is okay. Yeah. And because you meet a guy, uh, because you know that, that's it's the thing about the subconscious is sometimes if let's say you and I meet and you have a specific smell, I might not even recognize it, but my brain can associate your smell to the smell of a boy who was beating me up in the bus, for example. Mm. But I will have no idea. I don't. Sure. I don't smell you. But when I'm gonna come close to you, I'm gonna feel tense. Mm -hmm. it's like, there's something about Chris man I, I don't like the guy it's nothing to do with you nothing to do with you but my body feels in danger because of something that is sensed so that's what I mean it's not congruent because that's nothing to do with you yeah. and embrace will make us more um, back, more sensitive to what is actually happening mm -hmm. it's because we're not bothered by all those ghosts from the past right mm -hmm. and, and you know it's more challenging maybe alluding to a little bit of what we talked about in the beginning is you, you look at our ancestors, the more hunter gatherer, uh, you know, type of type of lifestyle that is relatively low stress most of the time, unless you're in battle or you're hunting. Like those are the, the two main times you're either, you're either prey or predator. Those two yeah. times is when the sympathetic nervous system would be activated, which is very, very helpful, but it's a real scenario that is either endangering you or you need that flood of sensory so that way life kind of goes in the slow motion so you can make that kill or you know do what whatever it is that, that you're trying to do but what's different about modern society is now we're not only dealing with a, a real stressor you know if you guys are if, if you engage in that you know if, if that's real for you which it, in most of the country you know in the United States we're pretty safe here i don't fear a bombing or you know like those sort of things but other parts of the country this is still a very real sure. thing but then you sure. also have the additional perceived stressor so that is your teacher or your dad that's always looking down on you that is the call of duty that is you know all of these sort of perceived sympathetic fight or flight survival scenarios we're, we're, we're exposed to it so many more times now that the brain and i think is that some of the wires might be kind of mixed up in some of these people because the brain is like, okay, normally, and this this is a life or death situation, I respond like this, but you responded as if you're in a life or death situation when you failed your test or when you this or that or the other thing. Yeah, or your latte is not made per perfectly. You know, mm -hmm. you it's like mm -hmm. it's it's it, and it's so much energy that we're wasting. Yeah, like it's like it's um, Lisa Feldman Barrett talk about body budget and there is so much energy that, that is coming out of us because of those situations that are perceived as danger, but actually are uh, irrelevant to our life mm -hmm. today. Mm -hmm. And this energy that we're, quote unquote, wasting for anxieties that, that um, are not meant to be, etc., it's energy that we don't save for our health, yeah. for our immune system to stay strong and healthy. That's why we see so many people sick as well, right. because of stress and anxiety yeah. and anger and frustration. It's energy constantly living. Yeah. And how do we... How do we recover this energy? We don't have many ways. Yes, some no. people go to yoga. 
uh, meditation, sport, but a lot of time we just watch Netflix mm -hmm. or, or who knows. It's not, we're not recovering this energy. So there's a lot of um, loss and not a lot of accumulation. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's such a good kind of segue into it's like it's it's good to understand the problem and flesh it out which i think we have fairly thoroughly in, in a really short amount of time which is amazing because <laughs> you could talk we could probably both talk about this for a long time but now we start to talk about okay so if the problem is energy leaving you know that we got to start talking about okay so what are ways to recover you know i know a lot of people i'm in my mid-30s a lot of people that come in are around the same age and they try to go work out like they did when you know they were 18 or 20 or you know whatever and it's like you're you got to pay attention to how you warm up and recover because our metabolic, nothing is the same as, as 15 years ago or, you know, whatever it is. Um, so you talk about recovery and, and it seems like that's more of the, the approach that you're taking. Like you said, it's not, I'm not changing your emotions or doling the emotions. It's more of let's find a way to turn the faucet off. So you're only expressing energy when necessary and you're conserving it or using it in, a, in another way to digest or to heal or to, you know, to what your body needs yeah. the, the rest of the time. So why don't you talk a little bit about what that process is like if someone were to call you and want to go through a, a consultation or, or one of your coaches? Yeah, sure. So um, what we do is called MRES, emotional resolution. And it's doing one thing, which is resolving disruptive emotional pattern. How do we do it? It's quite simple in the sense that um, if somebody comes to see us to resolve an anxiety, that's going to be the aim of the session, mm -hmm. and, and we're going to resolve it. Yeah, we, what we do is we're going to trick the body very gently, very specifically to generate this anxiety again. Never starting from a trauma, starting from like a situation such as, I went to Starbucks yesterday, my latte wasn't good, and I became so pissed. Okay, we're going to take this situation under control. For Starbucks, no trauma here. We never go to a trauma. Right. It's, uh, it's useless. Yeah. Uh, we... Uh, we go to a situation, we track, we, we trick the body to generate the emotion. What's going to happen is the person is not going to feel the emotion consciously. They're only going to feel physical sensations. Hmm. That's the sensory prediction happening now, the interoceptive prediction. At this point, the role, my role or the role of one of, of my practitioner will be to get the client to let the prediction play out until the end. Hmm. Easier said than done because yeah. when we feel an emotion, people start to like take some hmm. breath positive thinking, finding a reason why they feel that way, etc. No, no. Here the key is to guide the clients so they feel the physical sensations until the end of the prediction. And that takes uh, between two seconds and 90 seconds, never more, if mm. it's well done. What is happening is at the end of the sensory prediction, your body is expecting to be hit by some kind of danger. Yeah. That's a prediction. Yeah. But if you go to the end of the prediction, at the end of the prediction, when you didn't impact, when you didn't interfere with the sensations at all, at the end of the prediction, nothing is happening. Your body is safe and sound. From that very instant, the emotion will be resolved. Hmm. The prediction is updated from that very instant. Wow. Uh, you, don't have some, you don't have to do it again and again. You do it once. We, we update prediction in life constantly. Hmm. You know, uh, you go to a, an ice cream shop and you see a batches of ice cream, there's no label. There is a pink one, a green yeah. one, a green one, et cetera. And okay, I love uh, strawberry ice cream. So I'm gonna get the pink one, assuming that it's strawberry. And so the person gave me a, the pink ice cream and I eat it and it tastes like smoked salmon. Mm. Like how many times do you think I need to eat ice cream to know that in this store it's one time, one little bite. And forever I know that in this specific store, the pink stuff is smoked uh, salmon ice cream. And I will learn from this experience. Now when I go in any other shop and there's no label, I will ask for the flavors before I order something. Right. And that's updated. It takes one second. It doesn't wow. take much longer to update an outdated prediction when it comes to emotions. It's the same principle. Hmm. The problem is the control that we apply over our emotion through healthy stuff, such as breathing, positive thinking. Yeah, it's seen as healthy stuff, but neurobiologically, it's counterproductive to uh, um, integrate the emotion mm -hmm. that's all wow. you know wow. um, so that's what we'll do and Amazing. the more we're going to resolve this anger this anxiety all this stuff the more wow you 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 conserve a lot of energy mm -hmm. and so when you go for a walk in the woods mm -hmm. and you don't ruminate about stuff you know because your mind is more at peace mm -hmm. you recover twice as more you enjoy your you take in the nature 
Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know if I answer your question. <laughs> yeah, no, that's that's amazing. And, and it makes sense, you know, because we, you know, especially in America, like to like to control and we like to, you know, not not feel like we like to defer. And, you know what I mean? And so it makes sense. You know, it, it almost just like positive thinking and breathing can be like a medication where it does kind of numb out. It does change uh, the chemicals that are being expressed and, you know, whatnot. But it it does change the way the body's going to process next time. If it was halted, you know, then it's not going to be able to process fully and it's never really going to get, you know, you may be able to develop coping techniques, but it's never really going to resolve, like you said. That's the idea. And there's nothing against coping techniques. They are necessary because it does it does take courage and will to yeah. go into the sensations, right? Yeah. Because it's not about feeling emotions and if I feel angry and I scream my anger, that doesn't do anything because mm -hmm. by screaming, you're releasing energy. Mm -hmm. It's also a way to control. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really feeling the sensation, the tension accumulating in the body until they stop by themselves. Yeah. And, and we don't do that. Yeah. So you said it, if done well, it takes one time. Um, is there is there uh, scenarios where like the person can't go like so even though it only takes one time to rewire does it typically take just one session or do, do people have to usually do multiple sessions to kind of learn how to how to fully process so i would say that it takes if it's a quote unquote well done it takes one session or one resolution for yeah. emotion but we're all different yeah so we've got to learn how the person is um, what relationship they have with their body. Do they have any coping mechanism? Mm -hmm. uh, some people are afraid to get into the body, so we need to, to ease them to get into the body. Yeah. Uh, uh, a trust needs to be established as well. And when people do it for themselves by themselves, there are a few things they need to know. For example, in order for the resolution to happen, the body has to feel safe, mm -hmm. which is very different from mm -hmm. thinking that I'm safe and is my body feeling safe. Mm -hmm. A trick that we're using is when you feel an emotion, can you close your eyes and feel comfortable to close your eyes? If you want to look, if you want to keep your eyes open, your body doesn't feel safe. And we learned gotcha. that from working with animals. Cows and horses, we do MRS with cow and horses, cows and horses. And what we notice looking at mammals is the first sign of fear is not the ear, is no, no. The first sign of fear, you see that an animal is afraid because they stop blinking. Hmm. That's the first sign. It's the same thing for us. If we're having a hard time or we want to pick, it's because the body doesn't feel safe. Mm. So there's tricks like that, that, that uh, you need to, it's not tricks, it's, it, it's reestablishing an intimacy with the body, basically. Yeah, yeah. It makes sense. And, and you, know, you make it sound so simple, but I, I'm assuming it's a much more involved process, you know, making, for the practitioner, at least, knowing these scenarios and being able to, be able to, be able to pick up on those subtle things. Um, so if somebody was interested in, in scheduling a consultation, like where do they go to find a practitioner? Is this something that's done typically, you know, um, by, know, Zoom. The, by Zoom, not necessarily yeah. in person? Yeah. yeah. Some people, I um, personally, I see everybody by Zoom. Since the pandemic, I, I let go of my of my office. Mm. So and uh, I think a lot of practitioners do both Zoom and, uh, and in person. But mm -hmm. uh, you can go to my website, which is cedricbertelli.com. Uh, that will be to be uh, in contact with me or uh, emres e m r e s dot com mm -hmm. to for the for the main website explaining what emotional resolution is and have access to the directory and uh, and see the the science behind it and all that so emres dot com amazing well Cedric this has been such a powerful podcast I feel like we really packed in <laughs> people are gonna have to listen to this one a couple of times for sure um, anything else that you'd like to to add or empowering statement for people as we close um. First, I want to thank you. Thank you very much. It was a great, great, uh, great conversation. I really enjoyed it. And um, just one last thing would be no one has to live forever with any type of anxiety or PTSD or anger. We're not meant for that. Mm. And to resolve our emotional difficulties, do not take the value of what we lived. Mm. Uh, what we lived, a trauma, for example, uh, a trauma cannot be healed. It happened. There's nothing we can do about it. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to healing, it's about healing the wounds of the trauma. Mm -hmm. Every All the impact that this trauma have on your life today, this can be resolved. It's not mm -hmm. going to erase the memory of the trauma, maybe if you had a trauma, but the impact that the trauma has on your life today, this can be resolved. So you can live a life with way more peace. 
It's amazing. And that's so needed. Thank you for your work. Um, I appreciate it. And I think, you know, we're all doing all our small piece, not just to help people, yes. but to help change the world, which is what 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 we you know, we need. We need this next generation to really start stepping up and, and saying like, no, like this, we don't have to hang on to anger. We don't have to hang on to, to all these things that are causing division and, and judgment. And, and we can live at peace, you know, with, with each other and see the good in each other. And, and so I'm very thankful for your work. And I know you're 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 playing your part in, in changing the world. So I'm very thankful for you. Thank you. And, and it's same to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Healthy Perspective podcast. To connect with Dr. Bowman, follow him on Instagram at Dr. Chris Bowman. Until next time, make shift happen.